Well, hello, and welcome to another edition of FNR Ask the Expert. Today, we're talking about all things snakes and turtles. We're talking about biology, habitat, conservation, and also we might bust some of those myths you may think you know about the species. We'll also be taking your questions, so put those in the comments section um, here on Facebook throughout the broadcast. And if you're watching this in archive, feel free to put your questions in. We will get answers for you from our experts after the fact. So let us know what you wanna know as we go out throughout the broadcast. So joining us today, is Dr. Rod Williams, who's Professor of Wildlife Science here with Purdue FNR. We have Dr. Bruce Kingsbury, who is Director of the Environmental Resource Center at Purdue Fort, Purdue Fort Wayne. And Dr. Vicki Moretzky, who is Director of the Environmental Master's Program at Indiana University's Paul H. O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs. Thank you, Vicki, for that title. And so to get us started, um, we're talking about both species here, snakes and turtles, plus all of the things that go with them. So Rod, talk to us about both here in Indiana and also globally, um, what we're looking at in terms of species for both snakes and turtles. Sure, thanks, Wendy. But before I get started, just wanna highlight the fact that we have a wonderful collaboration between Purdue University and IU in this particular segment. So I'll just let that be known. Um, I am very pleased to be joined by my two esteemed colleagues here. Uh, really quickly, a, a brief overview about some of the reptilian diversity globally and then focus a little bit on Indiana. So first let's talk about turtles. Turtles are much uh, similar to what we see with the salamanders in terms of diversity and the number of species. There's roughly about 350 species of turtles globally. And Indiana has about 16 species of turtles. Now you compare that to uh, the reptilian cousins, the snakes. Uh, we have over 3000 species of snakes globally. Now turtles and snakes occur essentially globally except Antarctica. Uh, but in Indiana, we have a pretty solid diversity of snakes of about 29 different species. And I know Bruce is gonna talk about some of that diversity. But before I turn it over to Vicki, I mean, this diversity, even though we only have 16 species in Indiana, we see tremendous diversity, even in things like body size. So some of our turtles can be as small as just the simple palm of our hand. Other species like our snapping turtles can actually grow to the size of a small child. So with that, Vicki, why don't you just share with our audience a little bit about the diversity of the turtles that we have here in Indiana? Thanks, Rod, and thanks to the audience for being here. I will remember to unmute. So I want to start out by giving a shout out to turtles for being the oldest of the reptiles that we have on the planet today. They are not older than dinosaurs, but they did coexist with dinosaurs. So show some respect the next time you see a turtle. Let me see if I can get this moving forward. There we go. So in terms of groups of turtles, there's a first big break between turtles that fold their necks up like accordions and don't live here in North America and the rest of the turtles. And we're not here to talk about the side neck turtles, but I did wanna spend just a moment. So the three pictures here are of the side necked turtles. And you can see in the x-ray how it is that they fold their little necks up so that they can fit their heads inside their shells in between their two front legs. And there's actually a little extra bit of the shell that sort of opens it up a little bit to make some space for them there. But they are not ours. And so we must continue on to the hidden neck turtles, which are all of uh, our turtles in North America belong in this group. So you can see the big categories that scientists divide these turtles into here. And let's go ahead and take a look at some of them. Again, stopping to admire the side neck turtles just because they're so neat. There we go. All right, so a hidden neck turtle just pulls its head straight back. None of this folding it up like origami. Okay. And not only that, as a way of protecting its head and neck, it, it's really a better operation than the other one, but they may also be able to completely close the shell up. And the shell is gonna be an important part of what we're going to use to understand turtles a bit. So let's spend just a moment taking a look at that. The shell is the architecture that a turtle sort of hangs in. And if you look carefully, you can see in this image, the carapace, which is the curved top shell of the turtle, has the spine 
integrated into it. So the shell is a piece of the skeleton of the turtle. It's made from modified bones, a lot of them rib bones, which it doesn't have any of. But the spine is integrated and so too are the shoulder girdle and the hip girdle. So that if we look, this is a very indelicate look at the turtle, but the turtle has left, so it's okay. Uh, you can see how the architecture of the turtle is put together so that when the turtle picks itself up and moves, the whole thing just goes along as a unit. And so you, you will not find turtles crawling out of their shells. Uh, and should you need to eat a turtle, um, you will have some work ahead of you uh, getting all of this taken care of. But the architecture helps us to understand how the turtle will be able to move and why the shell um, is, is shaped the way that it is. So here are our soft shelled turtles, which are really a group apart. Unlike all of the other turtles, which have their top shells, their carapaces, covered in hard plate-like things called scutes, the soft shell turtles are, are, are much more like skin on the outside. And in addition, the edges of the shell lack those bony underpinnings that we find in the other turtles. So it's soft in a number of different ways. Soft shells are different in a couple of other factors as well. They've got very webbed feet rather than a little bit more toeiness, which we get in some of the turtles. And they're actually able to breathe underwater, which most turtles can't do. Turtles typically must surface to breathe. The soft shells can open their mouths and do a, a sort of a lung-like thing using the surfaces of their mouths to take in air. But if you look closely, you can see that they've also got a nose that's rather like a snorkel. And so they can sit in the bottom of shallow water and scope their heads up and just stick their nostrils out and remain hidden in the bottom, looking like the pancakes that they are uh, and still breathe. So a neat group of turtles, and we've got two different kinds here in Indiana that are distinguished by minor variations in their shells. All of the rest of the shells, the, 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 right, all of the rest of the turtles that we have are in a different set of groups. So here, this is the rest of the rest of the turtles, um, the pond and the box turtles and the tortoises. And in this group, we see a little bit more information in the shell about where things spend time. So the high domed shells, if you're out on the land a lot and need not to be eaten by a coyote. The wood turtle is sort of intermediate. And then the water turtles, which have got streamlined shells that are better for moving quickly in the water. On the other hand, we've also got the mud and the musk turtles, which refuse to read the book and are small and pretty aquatic and still have pretty high domed shells. But these are the ones Rod was talking about that are mostly the size of the palm of your hand. And they really make a lovely mouthful. And so the strength of a shell being stronger when it's domed probably helps to keep them from getting crushed. The other group that we have, the snapping turtles, people tend to be fairly familiar with, um, sometimes because you see them out in the middle of the road. Be careful as you move them on their way, but a shovel is very helpful for that purpose. And so these then are all of the turtles that we have. And we now know a little bit more about the groups and about how to tell what they do by what they look like. Turning it on over. Questions at this point? Good to go. All right, so we wanna hold on pets. Let's go ahead and um, jump it over to Bruce to talk about um, our snake species and then we'll circle back um, on the pet front um, okay. once we've talked about introduced all of our friends. So Bruce, take it away. All right, apparently um, after years of training, I still can't remember to turn off the mute. Uh, so does our, our snakes show up there? 
uh, nicely for everybody. Okay, very good. So um, I just thought I'd mention a few interesting things about snakes and then get into um, the, the diversity that, that we see and, and where that comes from. So um, some of the things that I always thought were fascinating about uh, snakes were um, the fact that they, they have no legs and no hands and uh, yet they've accomplished quite a, quite a few things quite successfully. They have a variety of ways of, of locomoting around their environment and uh, have, have highlighted um, four, four of those ways here. And uh, really, if they have something to push against, as is shown up here with the uh, lateral undulation, they can do so. Keep in mind that they're, uh, they are, they have very, very many uh, ribs and vertebrae, and uh, each one of those is associated with a suite of muscles that allows them a, a fine degree of control. And so if they have something to push against, uh, they will. If uh, they find themselves in a, in a, uh, in a tube-like structure, they can do the same sort of thing. And it, uh, if you can see that they sort of use like a, an earthworm kind of a locomotion where they, they push on one part of, of the tube and extend another part of their body. And then they affix that part of the body to the tube and, and draw up the, the back. And um, if they are just moving across a, a, a flat surface with very little to, to work with, they can still locomote in kind of an analogous sort of a way where they can stretch one part of their body and lift it off the ground and push it back against the ground and then pull that backwards while they lift another part of the body and um, get, get themselves moving forward. And then there's also side winding, which leads to these J-like uh, patterns on the, on the um, sand from something like a sidewinder. And basically what that is from, as is illustrated here, is they are having um, uh, two points of contact, limited contact with what's potentially a very warm surface. And then they just uh, exchange the contact zone uh, of the snake uh, uh, as, as they move forward. Um, another uh, cool thing about uh, about them is the fact that uh, they can eat um, very large objects. Here's a, um, a, an egg eating snake um, depicting that very nicely for us. Here's the essentially where the head is on the snake and here's, here's the jaw. And then it's managed somehow to magically eat this thing that's far larger than its head. And then um, they're, uh, a, for venomous snakes, they have fangs that they can uh, typically uh, extend out from their uh, heads. Um, and uh, with something like a rattlesnake, this here is a, um, is a, is a massasauga that I'm just uh, getting the fang to stick out on. And, and by the way, um, this snake is anesthetized. Um, if you do this without, with a snake that's not anesthetized, you are not brave, you are stupid. So don't do that. Um, yeah, kids, don't go home and try this yourself. So, um, but imagine the fact that you have a fang that when the, when the snake's mouth is open, it can strike, like a rattlesnake can, can strike a surface like that and yet it has to close its mouth and um, not bite itself. So um, these kinds of things relate to uh, uh, the um, amazing cranial kinesis that they have in their, in their skulls. The only kinetics you have in, in your skull are at the temporal mandibular joint between your jaw and your, and your skull. Uh, the snakes just have a, a wide array of um, different kinds of kinetics in the skull that allows them to um, unhinge the, the front of the, uh, the jaws to move the, the different um, teeth uh, rows, that, and there are many, um, independently. And also to just to um, touch on one example down here where you have something like a rattlesnake, the, the, the snake 
opens its jaw and the quadrate roll uh, rocks downward, the pterygoid rocks forward, that pushes on the, on the maxilla and, it, and extends the fang. And then when it closes its jaw, the opposite happens. So they're able to do things without hands. They're able to eat really large objects and um, are also able to um, not uh, bite themselves. All right, so there's just a little bit of uh, introduction to um, why snakes are cool. And then, um, then I briefly now would like to talk a little bit about the diversity of the, um, the groups of snakes um, that are represented in Indiana. And um, most of our snakes are in the Colubridae. The, um, the Colubridae are amazingly diverse. Um, they are uh, by far the most uh, speciose, that is they have the most species um, for uh, around the world. In Indiana, you're gonna kind of pick your area, except perhaps uh, Australasia, and um, they, they dominate. Um, they uh, are providing a, a, a lifetime career for many uh, scientists who are trying to figure out how they're related to one another. Um, and that um, is not entirely sorted out. Most of the species are not venomous, but some are, and, and actually some of ours are, but they are so small and so, um, uh, and, and that kind of thing that they're, they're not a hazard for us. And most of our snakes are colubrids. So a little diversity on, on that front. We have um, the typical species like the um, garter snakes and, um, if, if, you, if you see a, uh, a snake that has stripes on its body, um, it's, not, it's not venomous. Um, that's, your, that's your first helpful tip of the day. Um, but um, these uh, garter snakes are really variable. Here's just a couple of examples. Same species, uh, just a great deal of diversity. And, and I could give you 10 different um, variants on, on this one, but these are, these are the common snakes that we that we see. Actually, if you're, if you're in a park and you're, and you're walking around in the woods, probably what you're going to see is um, one of the ribbon snakes. Um, and uh, so these, these snakes are, are the, the garter snakes are not always striped, but usually they are. And then the ribbon snakes are just a very slender version of, of these guys, very, but very common in a, in a healthy forest with wetlands and that kind of thing in there. Another very common uh, group of uh, snakes or commonly observed snakes are um, what we could call the common water snakes, which in the south is the midland water snake and in the north is the uh, northern water snake. If you see a, a snake in, a, in any kind of a water body, the chances are very good that this is what you're looking at. And as I'll, as I'll get to at some point today, uh, they're not cotton mouths. In fact, it, cotton mouths may no longer exist in the state of Indiana. And they've never existed in, in the last couple hundred years over most of Indiana. We do have some big, larger snakes. Um, one of the largest species we have uh, in the colubrids is uh, what used to be called the black rat snake and is now called the gray rat snake. And, um, they can get uh, four or five feet long, maybe, maybe a little bit longer um, in Indiana, but as you go further south, they can get much longer and much larger um, in, in the southeastern United States. Here's a close up of a uh, 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 rat snake uh, face. And uh, one thing I'll, I'll come back to when I'm talking about venomous snakes is the, is the nature of the pupil. And this is what I would call an elliptical pupil where you have a round or oval shaped uh, pupil. And the other thing that, that this is a useful picture for is the notion of keeled scales. Keels are these, these ridges that run down the, the middle of each scale. And that's really obvious on the, um, on the rat snake. Another uh, big snake is the, is the racer. And in the South we have, they have a, a black coloration. So here's a, Here's a black racer. And to the north, they take on more of a blue 
coloration and, and can get really handsome sort of a sky or baby blue look to them in, in some places. And, and these snakes can also get quite large, uh, certainly four or five feet. And then, and, and then further south in the United States, they can get quite a bit longer. Uh, so those are, those are examples of, of large non-venomous snakes and actually um, not, not dangerous. Uh, although now that I've, I've said that, I can think of this is this species, the racer is, is the one species I can think of that is very effective at bluffing. And that um, if you chase after one, it might try to get into a bush or something and then it'll turn around and face you. And, um, and when a snake turns around and faces you and is, is uh, several feet long, you, you do think a little, a little bit more carefully about what you wanna do next. When they're babies, they look like this. So they're, they're very different. And, but as they get older, they, they, uh, they lose those spots and take on the adult coloration. And, and then quickly, there's a lot of different species of snakes. But the other thing I wanna point out about colubrids is that many of them are small. And so um, here's a, a brown snake or what, what can be called a decay snake uh, sometimes. Um, this is a big one. This is as big as they get. Uh, Red-bellied snake, another small one. These are like on, this, on the order of the size of a pencil. And one of my favorites is a ringneck snake. These snakes are very small. They would, they would, if they were curled up, they would fit in the middle of the palm of your hand. And with, I can't leave the colubrids without mentioning one of my favorite species, which is the um, hognose snake. Here's one uh, bluffing. Um, these actually are venomous, uh, but uh, unless you make it bite you and stick your finger in there and you're very patient, you, uh, you, won't, you wouldn't know that, but they uh, will uh, flatten out, they'll hiss, they'll, they'll strike, but they strike with their uh, mouth closed. And so it's all bluff. And if that doesn't work, they will die. And um, this is one of uh, nature's most hilarious uh, acts. They writhe around, they poop all over the place and they die. And then you can, um, once they're all done with the drama, you can pick them up and they just, they're, they're, they're lifeless. Um, but if you wait around for a little while, they'll, they'll come back to life and, and crawl away. And the last thing I'll say about them is, they don't like to be dead right side up. So if, you, if, they, if they get into this position and you turn them over, they insist on dying all over again. And I don't think that's very convincing. Anyway, one of my, one of my favorites. Then the other group are the, are the vi is in the viparids. Uh, these are around the world, not as species as uh, the colubrids, but still quite diverse. Um, and of course, uh, the, the, the snakes that we have are within this group. A little, um, some, some features for you about the viparids, uh, hollow retractable fangs. They typically have those keeled scales I point out to you. They are um, ovoviviparous, uh, a live bearing, um, which I, I hate saying that because eggs aren't dead, uh, but, but there you go. Um, they have venom, and this is some sort of cocktail that's a mix of um, what would you call uh, hematoxins, which would be actually uh, di digestive uh, in nature versus um, neurotoxins, which, which impact um, muscle function. And um, the venom glands are actually derivatives of uh, salivary glands. And so uh, um, they are uh, digestive initially in nature. And in fact, venom is, is digestive. But for us within the vipers, we have the pit vipers, a, a sub subfamily. And um, so they are, all of our snakes have this, uh, this cool heat sensitive uh, pair of pits uh, in, the, in the front end of the snake. Actually the nostril is, is right here. And then there's that vertical cat-like pupil um, that, that they all have. If you're looking at a large snake and you're relatively close to it and you can see it has a vertical pupil, it's one of, it's, at least if you're in Indiana, you are looking at um, one of the pit, pit vipers. Um, 
that little rule doesn't apply if it's a little tiny snake or if you're somewhere else. But nostril, heat sensitive pit, and that vertical uh, pupil. We at least used to have uh, four species of venomous snake, um, the Eastern Massasauga, um, the cottonmouth or, or uh, water moccasin, timber rattlesnakes, and, and copperheads. And I know this is something that a, a lot of people are curious about, so, so I'll uh, integrate some of, some of uh, the thinking about them here by talking about pit vipers as, as I wrap this up. Um, copperheads are our most common um, venomous snake. Um, they are um, actually fairly abundant in many areas in, in southern Indiana. Um, that doesn't mean you will see them. They are exceptionally good at staying hidden. And if we have time uh, later, I can talk about why. Um, but they're, they're, they're very cryptically colored, um, but they, they are fairly abundant. That Midland water snake can be mistaken for copperheads, but keep in mind, um, for one thing, um, there's no pit, there's no vertical pupil, and these are going to be associated with uh, aquatic areas like lakes and ponds and streams in the in the uh, copperheads like to be up on rocky uh, on on uh, rocky hillsides that kind of thing another species is the cottonmouth uh, i'm not aware of any uh, confirmed locations for those snakes in at least 20 years and um, they they used to occur down um, near the o ohio river in a couple of areas but i I think, um, I, I think they're gone um, and they never, you can go over to Kentucky or Missouri or even in Southern Illinois and find places where they are abundant, however, not in Indiana. Here's another view of one. One thing um, I'll point out here that you can see in the, um, in the shape of the head, you can see it here with the, with the cotton mouth and then over back here with the copper head is they have they don't have triangular heads they have block like heads with and they're they're very angular you can see these this this angular nature to it as well as those as those pits and um, so uh, I don't like thinking about talking about venomous snakes as having triangular heads because a lot of non venomous snakes will flatten themselves out and try to look big and nasty and and uh, but they're but they're not. So sometimes because of the aquatic nature of the snakes, they, um, uh, the um, common water snake can be mistaken for, for them. Um, the closer match, although still not quite, um, in terms of head structure is the diamondback water snake, a non-venomous snake in, in areas of Southern Indiana. But again, notice that pupil, it's um, not that vertical pupil. And they, here's, a, here's a triangular head, this is a snake that's um, that I've caught out exposed and it's trying to look as nasty as possible. Actually, I would not want to be bitten by the snake because it would hurt, um, but at least it's not venomous. Then we have the timber rattlesnakes. Um, these are our largest, most dangerous uh, venomous snakes. Uh, here's Tiny, the timber rattler that we studied for a number of years in Brown County State Park, um, whose demise came from a, a a windstorm or a branch fell on top of its head and killed it. Too bad. Um, here's another one uh, to show you the cryptic coloration that the snakes can have. By the way, these snakes are, are very passive. They are not aggressive. Unless you catch them trying to cross a road and you confront them or on a path, something like that, you can stand right next to them. They'll never move. In fact, there's, there's uh, I haven't tried this myself, but you can actually step on them and they won't do anything. They're just, they just want you to go away. And really, if you see one, be grateful that you saw it and uh, take some pictures and then just go around it and go on your way. Um, and these really only occur in, in uh, a few places in Southern India, Indiana, mostly around Brown County, County State Park and in those forests there. And lastly, um, the Massasauga, 
Um, this is the only venomous snake in uh, northern Indiana. And uh, again, you can see the vertical pupil, the pit in the, in the nostril. Um, there's a, quite a few snakes that people think are Massasaugus, but are not. There's the, the shiny, glossy milk snake. It's very common. The one that actually looks, in some cases, like uh, a Massasauga. I've seen actually bits of snake that people have sent me photos of where they chop the front and back ends off for various reasons and wondered what it, what the piece was. And it was a not a Massasauga or rattlesnake, but a hognose snake. And northern water snakes and even fox snakes, some, sometimes around Lafayette and those areas, people think that they found a giant Massasauga, but it's, it's a fox snake. So um, there's our Massasauga. All right, so that's what I have for a little bit of diversity and, and uh, some discussion about venomous snakes. So Bruce, while we're on the topic of snakes, we have a question from the audience. Um, a quick question, first of all, from Elaine, do snakes eat their infertile eggs? And then secondly, um, you talked a lot about venomous and, and those type of things. What is the difference between venomous and poisonous? So just correct that, correct that all for us. Um, and I know Vicki has something she wants to chime in with to, to uh, help us all out with that. But first, let's start with the eggs. You mentioned them eating eggs. So what eggs are they eating? All right, well, um, so uh, there are a variety of snakes that, that uh, actually will eat um, other, other animals' eggs. Um, and uh, so that was not um, their own eggs. Uh, now, my first response, well, I don't know if they eat their own infertile eggs, um, but I have certainly observed them eat I have uh, like amphib sea amphibians eat their skin and that kind of thing as they shed it. Um, so maybe somebody, somebody knows something that I don't. Um, but uh, this, is, this is, the uh, the snakes that do this are doing it a, in a dietary sense. And this is part of their, part of their diet. Now the, the venomous, um, the venomous question, um, so uh, I liked that we were having a little discussion before we, we went live and, and, uh, and I liked the, um, the question of um, uh, if, if you bite them, who dies? I, th I think that's a marvelous thing. If, if you bite them and you die, they were poisonous. If you bite them and they die, you, you were venomous. But poison has to do with um, the danger of ingestion, like you have the, the venoms on the on the skin of a toad or um, the tadpoles of a toad are, are um, hazardous for a predator. Venom is something that's injected. So um, uh, as, uh, as, as Rod pointed out, um, uh, you, you can eat, uh, you can eat a, a venomous snake because it's not poisonous. So um, I, I love that. Uh, that example is as well, but uh, so it has to be injected to be venom. Vicki, did you have anything you wanted to add on? Go ahead, Rod. I was just going to add, you know, you know, Bruce was talking about the venomous snakes and the non-venomous snakes. And, and a question I oftentimes get asked is, even if a snake is non-venomous, will it bite me? And my general response is, does it have a mouth? And if it has a mouth, it could bite you in defense as part of its yeah. defensive behavior. Yeah, that's the, when people ask me these questions and they say, well, it was aggressive. And it was like, of course it's aggressive. It doesn't want you to eat it. It thinks you're gonna eat it. And so does it bite in self-defense? Uh, sure, um, it's nothing personal. It thinks- so would you. <laughs> so would you. Yeah, I, I, I guarantee when some predator grabs a hold of you, you're gonna do whatever you can think of to get away. So we've talked a little bit about the ones we might see out in the wild, um, but Vicki, I, I know you were going to talk to us a little bit about snakes and turtles as pets and the pet trade and some things we might want to consider um, if we're looking at maybe taking one of them home or buying one in a pet store. Absolutely. Give me just a moment here and we'll get shared. Do you now have a sickeningly cute font in front of you saying turtles and snakes as pets? Yes, okay. Uh, turtles and snakes are not cute. 
uh, although they can be attractive, uh, they can be um, mysterious, they can be all sorts of other things, but the maybe, maybe not thing is, is really important here. Some of it's legal, some of it's common sense. So let's take a look and see what we've got. This is the DNR's page. You'll notice that they have an entire page on turtles as pets. And we're gonna start with turtles, we'll go to snakes. So this is what that page says once we get a little bit closer to it. Um, and turtles are more trouble than most people expect. I think they see them as sort of living pet rocks. And it, it ain't true. They need care, they need particular nutrients. Uh, they are not into people and they're not active and they don't learn tricks. And so they often end up being bored, which means that people want to put them back, which isn't possible. They need heat and they need specifically ultraviolet light if they're to grow properly. So you can't just stick them under any light bulb and expect them to be healthy. And so these are more in terms of requirements, in terms of lifespan, in terms of diet, uh, what you might do with them after you've decided that the children have gone off to college and now what? Uh, all of these things are potentially issues. And lastly, turtles are not harmed by salmonella. And as a result, they can be vectors for salmonella. In the pet trade, it's very frequently the case that a turtle will end up with salmonella. But even if you take one from the wild and are raising it in home where you think that all will be well, it's still possible to end up with salmonella being transported. And as a result of all of this, it's not encouraged. More to the point, the pet trade is one of the big threats to turtles worldwide. It's right behind the food and medicinal markets for Asia, which are the biggest threat right now to turtles of the world. Uh, unfortunately, the case that a number of the Asian countries have already worked through their own turtle populations to the point of near extinction. And there is a market for these things. And so we don't particularly want to see the pressure of the pet trade being added to the pressures that these species are already facing. And so not that long ago, we saw four of the turtles um, that are present in the US that got added to the international list of thou shalt not trade in order to protect them specifically from this problem. In Indiana, we have a number of endangered species of turtles. If you go back to my last slide, I listed which ones uh, were endangered. And although box turtles are not specifically endangered, they are protected from pet collection. Box turtles have become rather rare on the landscape, not to the point of endangerment per se, but to the point where they don't necessarily have an easy time finding mates. And so reducing the, the pet collection gives us a better chance that our children and our children's children will be able to enjoy box turtles in the wild. So there are limits uh, in terms of endangerment or other kinds of protection. You can't take them off of DNR property unless you're taking one of the species that is considered a game species and you have an appropriate um, permit for that. You can only release them to the wild if you've held them very briefly and without any other animals around so that there's no chance for introducing disease back into the wild. So there's all sorts of limits here on the sale. Um, again, you can see bullfrogs and green frogs are um, considered game animals. You can hunt them for food and so you can take them in that way and if you need to, you can sell them. Uh, there are eight species of native snakes that can be held. Um, but otherwise, um, things are really pretty carefully constrained here in order to protect turtles that are already being hammered by international trade uh, as well as, pet, as the pet trade. Snakes are not quite so badly stressed from an international perspective, 
although there are parts of the United States where it's much worse. So there are a number of varieties of small and rather decorative rattlesnakes in Arizona, for example, that get hit hard by the pet trade and by international trade. Most of Indiana species are in somewhat better shape, but they're still complicated animals to keep as pets. You need to know what species you have. As Dr. Kingsbury mentioned, some of these will get to be five feet long. Most of people don't want a snake that, that, that's that long. They eat animals and you cannot convince them that they have to eat you know, salad, it's not going to happen. They have requirements in terms of housing. They need particular temperatures in order to be healthy. And like the turtles, they don't do tricks. They don't come when you call them. They are not emotionally attached to people. When we were putting this presentation together, Professor Kingsbury mentioned he'd had one snake for 35 years. Uh, again, when the kids go off to college, you need to know what you're going to do with these things and you cannot put them back in the wild. So snakes are a little bit um, less of a problem in terms of conservation, but they are still an issue in terms of intelligent ownership and ethical ownership of an animal uh, and in terms of the long-term care of the animal. I think that's what I have uh, for slides on all of this and um, able to take questions now, or as Wendy said, if you've got questions later on, feel free to put them in chat and uh, we can see where things are going there. Well, one of the things you mentioned there, Vicki, was how large some of these snakes can get. Um, so Bruce or Vicki, which one of you, um, talk about maybe some of those, I know Bruce mentioned them already, some of the big snakes, but how big do like, let's say vipers, and things like that we might see in the wild. I know that's a concern for some people is, is it gonna fall out of a tree and like attack me or you know, things like that? Um, and we've heard those questions. I know Rod's gonna know. Not, not willingly. I'm gonna leave that to Bruce, but the answer is it depends. I'd say never go outside and, and uh, no, no, I would not. Uh, so uh, uh, one, one thing that came up before with, with snakes as pets is, is actually the Massasaugas a large one is about two feet long. And so it, it, they, they have significant collection pressure because it's uh, uh, quote unquote sexy to have a venomous snake. And here's one that's not that long. Um, but uh, um, the copperheads get a, a little bit longer than that. It's the, the timber rattlesnakes um, that are actually the ones that can get quite, quite long and, and uh, um, Again, as you go further south in the United States, they 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 might get longer than the than the four feet or so that you that you might see here. Um, but uh, a large timber rattlesnake is very impressive, um, and 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 all they they only weigh a few pounds, and they're not you know ten feet long. Nevertheless, they're the, they're a very impressive, very handsome uh, snake. So um, and actually, I think. They um, are our heaviest snake um, in terms of how big does a snake get, and then and then uh, the runners up are going to be those uh, the rat snake and um, then the racer. So Vicky, we have a question for you from Shelby. Um, she wants to know, and, and we've talked about this in other things. I know Rod's mentioned it in MythBusters and things like that. Can you explain the importance of if you have to move a turtle or a snake? to keep them in the same direction that they're going rather than turning them around and making them start their journey all over again. This is a little bit like, will it bite me and does it have a mouth? And if it has a mouth and you make it desperate, these, these are not, they're not wind up toys. They're, they're animals living a life. And when you come across them, they have a reason for being going in the direction in which they're going. And that's the main reason for just trying to, to keep them moving in that direction because if they're single-minded enough, if they're, for example, a, a female turtle heading out of water and looking for a place to dig a nest, she is not interested in going back to the water. She's full of eggs, they're heavy, she wants to get rid of them, and she needs to do that someplace where she can dig a hole. Heading back to the water is not on her menu. Um, but in general, these things are going where they're going for a reason. So letting them continue in that direction, continue into whatever habitat it is, the road is not a habitat. So in the road situation, getting them across the road in the direction that they're moving is the appropriate thing to do, 
if you can do it safely. And as has already been made abundantly clear, some of the turtles uh, will bite. Even some of the turtles that are not snapping turtles still have powerful jaws. And it's not always clear which ones are able to move their heads all over the place and which ones are more contained. So it's best to move with a stick or a shovel if you're pretty sure that you're not dealing with something that's venomous, um, but still not to be coming in, into contact, hand contact with things. And if you're dealing with something that's venomous, then standing back at a considerable distance with a stick. Um, Bruce, what is the, the thing? So twice body length is a safe distance for most of them? That's that's a decent ballpark. I think the, the thing to not, as well as being uh, passive, a, a snake can be very quick over a, a few feet, but after that, they're not. Yeah. And they, uh, they come up a stick at you every once in a while if they're particularly peeved. So you yeah, can and, and the, the thing that. is, just you just give them a, a little a little uh, space, and then um, really almost every species of snake you could just casually walk away, and they're not going to be able to catch up to you. And even the fastest snakes, if you hustle a little bit, if you're still walking, um, but they you can't catch they can't catch you either. So unless you're Maybe if you're in the middle of Africa and a mamba's coming after you, that's one thing. But uh, around here, you just walk away. Yeah, I think only moving out of the road is a reason to, to think about moving really anything. And my comment about copperheads was not that they could catch up with you at a jog. They absolutely can't, but that they strike particularly quickly. Um, it's, it's particularly interesting to watch them. All snakes tend to strike faster than the average human is accustomed to moving their hand out of the way. So yeah, this is another good. reason not to be getting your hands around them. And we've talked a lot about the different varieties and things like that. I wanted to get before we before we close out um, about the conservation issues. And I know that's a big part of your guys's research and things like that. And so we wanted to talk about the importance of wetlands and uplands and of climate change. So Bruce, I'm going to start with you about the importance of wetlands and, and uplands for these species. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm going to, um, I'll go ahead and, and pick up the screen. I, um, we're, we're running out of time. And so I'm going to allow me to, to jump a little bit um, as I um, work through this. Um, one of the things that I want to highlight and I'm going to, I'll go through quickly through these slides, but that uh, ephemeral wetlands are really important, which is um, something uh, on the minds of a lot of us these days. But um, these are wetlands that if you, if you, um, uh, if you look at them in the, in the winter, they're, they don't have any water in them. And if you visit in the spring, um, uh, then the, then the, then the, they start to fill with the with the melt off and that kind of a thing, and and then they're now they look like a, some just some water of no particular value. But if you follow the same area in the in the summer, now it looks like it might be worth something uh, in terms of of wildlife. And indeed, back here there's uh, salamanders and frogs uh, of all different kinds that are actually dependent on these kinds of systems that if you don't have them in your habitat uh, landscape, you do not have many of the interesting species that, uh, that we have in Indiana. And um, so uh, that at this, in the middle of the summer or in the, in the late spring, you have tadpoles are gonna metamorphose into, um, into uh, uh, little miniature adults and um, we're not talking about amphibians today, but we are, I uh, do point out that uh, there's plenty of snakes and turtles that eat those amphibians. And so there's a, there's a trophic cascade of food web that's pretty important. Um, and then by fall, these are gone again. And so, and so if, we're, if we're not alert to what, what they are and how important they are in the functionality of the landscape, we might not take um, these these wetlands very seriously, but indeed they're critical. Um, and so they're dry, but the but the frogs and the salamanders are out already, so so they don't care. 
Um, then the other thing that I wanted to point out is that there are many different kinds of shallow wetlands. And the more of the diversity you have of them, the more diversity you have in terms of uh, uh, snakes and turtles and, and, and a whole host of organisms. So if we, we could talk about copper bellies, massasaugas, spotted turtles, blandings turtles, all these different sorts of things. And if we um, look at the, at the, the, the size of the turtle based on some measurement of their shell and the average water depth, little, these little in, imperiled species need really shallow water, 10 centimeters of water. That's like a, um, that's the, the length of your hand. And even the largest turtles are only use, using water that's um, shin deep. So these kinds of systems for these turtles are very important. And then if we, if we, if we tease this apart, we can throw in uh, baby Blanding's turtles, uh, teenagers, adults, and we can add, add other things like spotted turtles, copper bellies, um, uh, massasaugas over here, uh, Kirtland snakes, butlers, garter snakes. And, and uh, so I've, you notice I've loaded these and they're all in really shallow water. So if we stretch that out a little bit, we can, we can tease these apart a little further. And what I want you to see is how important really shallow water is. And then we can add a notion of flashiness. That is how quickly does the, this water change in terms of depth? And so over here, I have the animals being on shore and here I have that uh, water. And then the little turtles are, are right there um, and then as they get, as the blanding turtles get larger, they can occupy a variety of kinds of water. We throw our, our spotted turtles in there. Copper bellies are spending a lot of time on land. Massasaugas are mostly on land. Kirtland snakes are kind of right on that cusp. Same for butler's garter snakes. So my point is that as you look at this wetland diversity, um, and you think about shallow wetlands, you, you realize how, how critical those are. And then um, the last thing, um, uh, courtesy uh, Dr. Moretsky, uh, I can, can uh, show you this notion of connectivity. We talk about the importance of wetlands, not just as individual wetlands, but as uh, parts of complexes. And what we always want to keep on, in mind is that we want to have connectivity across the landscape for all of these different critters to get from one place or another. We cannot have wetlands by themselves as single wetlands and have the diversity that we would like. And so we need to be always thinking about connectivity. And so then Dr. Moretsky, I want to toss it to you real quick to talk about the effects of climate change on these species uh, before we close out today. Let me get shared in here and there we go. All right. Uh, and somehow we are not ending up in the right place. This is always going to happen only when we've got, I'm just gonna go ahead and do the easy thing. It's not as graceful. It doesn't look as good, but it'll work. All right. Heaven only knows why it doesn't want to do what it's supposed to do, but here we go. So the big climate change for Indiana, warmer temperatures overall, warmer nights specifically, longer growing seasons, more flooding, more storms, and yet at the same time, more drought in the summer and the early fall. So if we look at projected change in spring precipitation, we can see that spring flooding is expected to come on as long as we keep burning fossil fuels. If we want to look at extreme storms, we can see that things that are considered highly unusual are increasing in their frequency. And if we want to look at what happens with drought and the bottom of the um, water bodies running out of oxygen, not so much a problem for the animals that we're talking about today, but definitely a problem for some of the things that they eat. 
And so in places where we're getting deader water, uh, the things that eat them will run into problems. So if we look at this in terms of turtles, this, the prolonged summer droughts are going to be fragmenting and reducing habitat and potentially as a result, stressing the animals and increasing disease and mortality. It's true that on a flood, things that live in the water can disperse more easily and move out across the landscape. But if what they're going to is fragmented and broken up, it's less useful. One of the things people don't think about is the ripple effects of drought, which is that farmers are beginning to irrigate more throughout the Midwest. And as a result, water tables are dropping, which is going to be a problem for any of our wetland habitats. Uh, flooding, when it happens, tends to cause humans to do foolish things. We do a lot more manipulation of hydrology, none of which is ever really good. Winter warming and winter severe cold are both an issue for things that hibernate at depths that are supposed to not involve either heat or cold. And we have nest issues that we need to deal with. We've got species that are moving across the landscapes, across continents, trying to get to the right place in terms of climate. But all of the species we're talking about today are relatively slow. And then lastly, we have this weird thing with turtles. Turtles tend to determine the sex of their offspring, not by things like X and Y chromosomes, but by the temperature at which the eggs are incubated. It's a very odd system. Turtles aren't the only ones, but there's not a lot of things that do this. Warming up the nest for turtles tends to mean more females. And you'd think, oh, that's great, more reproduction. But sooner or later, no matter how much you want to say otherwise, you got to have the males in there. And if you don't have very many of them, you're not going to get much reproduction. And if they're breeding with many females, everybody in the area is going to be, end up being half brothers and half sisters. And over time, this is not a good idea. So temperature dependent sex determination is sort of like this sleeper problem for turtles in specific. And we can see that people are worried about these sorts of things. I won't spend time here. It will be in the PowerPoint for you if you wanna go back and look at this. Okay. Just to look at where we are with snakes, it's pretty much the same story without the temperature dependent sex determination. And although snakes may move faster than turtles on average, Climate change is moving faster than even some of the larger mammals can move. And so the range issue and trying to get to the right place for the conditions that you need is going to be a problem in the longer run. If we can solve climate change, if we can start getting smarter about it and the planet hits the wall going 10 miles an hour instead of 50 miles an hour, then more of our species will manage to catch up to the conditions that they need. But if we continue to use a lot of fossil fuel and climate change really takes off and accelerates dramatically, we have very few species among any of the HERP groups that are going to be able to keep up. Well, thank you so much. I know we've covered a lot of information today. So if you have any questions and you're watching this in archive, please put those in the comment section. Um, feel free to pause it as you're going. You can look at the slides that Dr. Maretsky just scare, uh, shared. Uh, a couple of things I'm going to drop in the um, comment section for you guys is we, we didn't have time because um, we covered so much information um, is the Indiana Herp Atlas, which I encourage you to go look at. Uh, Dr. Kingsbury has a lot of um, influence and a lot of ties to that. And also um, we'll drop another identification method in the comment section for you. So I just want to say thank you um, to Dr. Williams, Dr. Moretsky, and Dr. Kingsbury for joining us today. Um, I know it was super educational. We learned a lot about a lot of species and um, how to better take care of them and don't take them home. <laughs> I think that's our number one lesson. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Um, we'll be back at this in a couple of weeks talking about more Indiana herps. Um, it'll be uh, Dr. Rod Williams with us again. We really like him, so we're going to bring him back. Um, and then we will also have uh, Mike Lodato and Nathan Engbrecht with us um, at that time. So noon in two weeks, April 15th, and we will see you there. So thanks for joining us. Bye, everyone.